What is a sequence? You might be thinking, surely this lesson doesn't have any surprises. A sequence is just a list of numbers in some definite order. And you're pretty much right, but in today's Wrath of Math lesson, we'll dig a bit deeper into the definition and take a look at some common notation and terminology as we begin to study sequences. So here, of course, is an example of a sequence. The three dots at the end, called ellipses, indicate that the sequence continues infinitely. A sequence doesn't have to be infinite. Our sequence could stop right here, but we'll mostly be interested in studying infinite sequences. Each number in a sequence is called a term of the sequence. So, for example, one half is the first term of this sequence, two thirds is the second term, and so on. In other words, for every term in the sequence, there is a corresponding positive integer that describes that number's position in the sequence. Three-fourths, for example, is the third term in the sequence. Four-fifths is the fourth term, and so on. In this way, we can think of a sequence as being a function from the positive integers to the real numbers, so long as we're talking about real valued sequences. Or, if you prefer, instead of writing positive integers as the domain, we could write the natural numbers, just the set containing one, two, three, and so on. Then, using familiar function notation and talking about this sequence, we could write that f of 2, for example, is equal to 2 thirds, because that is the second term in the sequence. However, when discussing sequences, we won't usually use traditional function notation. Instead, we would write that f sub 2 is equal to 2 thirds, and that's how we would represent the second term in the sequence f. You might notice that this sequence follows a pretty simple pattern. The fourth term, for example, has four in the numerator, and the denominator is one greater. It's five. And in general, for this sequence, the nth term, fn, is equal to n divided by n plus one. Again, looking at our example, f sub two, the second term, is two divided by two plus one, divided by three. Not all sequences have this property that any term in the sequence can be easily calculated by some formula, but a lot of the sequences we'll study do. And it's quite handy. If we want the 100th term in the sequence, for example, f100, that's just equal to 100 divided by 101. Here's an example of a sequence that cannot be described with such a simple equation, the sequence of prime numbers. We don't have a closed form formula to calculate the nth prime number. Here's another popular example of a sequence that does have a formula for the nth term of the sequence, but it's a little more complicated than this. This is the Fibonacci sequence, so we'll call it big F. For this sequence, the first term is equal to one, and the second term is equal to one as well. But every other term in the sequence is equal to the sum of the previous two terms. So for all n greater than two, for all terms after the second term, fn is equal to fn minus one, the previous term, plus fn minus two, the previous previous term. For example, five is equal to two plus three. Now let's talk a bit more about notation. Even though sequences are ordered unlike sets, they'll often be placed inside brackets like we use for sets. Then, of course, we'd have to rely on context to know that this is a sequence and not a set. But one way we can make it a little more clear that it is a sequence is by doing this. After the ellipses, we can write the formula for the nth term of the sequence, and then put some more ellipses to indicate that the sequence continues. By doing this, we show here are the first few terms of the sequence for your convenience, and in general, the nth term of the sequence is given by this expression. Another easy way to represent a sequence, if it has a nice expression like this for the nth term of the sequence, is to give it a name, like a, for example, and then just write the formula for the nth term of this sequence. So we could write that a n is equal to one over n, just for an example of a sequence. If we just write this, this is describing the sequence one over one, one over two, 1 over 3, and so on. As you see here, we'll usually represent sequences with lowercase letters, and a common choice will be A. 
there is some potential for weakness in both of these notations. Neither of them explicitly say that n has to start at 1. In this notation, it's kind of implied just because we wrote the general expression. And so since n is in the numerator and we see the numerator of our first term is 1, it's clear that n starts at 1. But if we got rid of that and just wrote the sequence like this, how do we know the sequence isn't supposed to be described by this expression, n minus 1 divided by n, where n starts at 2? Admittedly, for this sequence, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. But if for convenience or some other reason we want the first input value of our sequence to be 2 or 3 or something other than 1, we can do that. Just to see an example of that, as well as an example of a finite sequence, let's modify the sequence in white so we're just looking at this sequence of three terms. Then we can still think of it as a function, but its domain is no longer the natural numbers. Instead, we could represent this sequence as the function with a domain of the set containing 2, 3, and 4, and its codomain is just the real numbers. And the function, just as before, is defined by n over n plus 1. So then if we plug in 2, we would get 2 divided by 2 plus 1, which is 2 over 3, the first term of our sequence. So that works just fine. However, I think it's clear why it might be preferable for n to start at 1. For example, with this sequence, if we write f sub 2 and we're not being super clear, it might be kind of confusing. Is this supposed to mean the function describing the sequence with an input of 2? Or is f2 supposed to refer to the second term of the sequence? Thankfully, if we want to, we can change the expression that describes our sequence so that n can start at 1. So for this sequence, as an example, we could rewrite the expression as n plus 1 divided by n plus 2. And then we can change our domain to what we want it to be, starting with 1, and then we also have 2 and 3. Then the first term of the sequence, f1, is equal to 1 plus 1 divided by 1 plus 2, which is equal to 2 thirds, and that is indeed the first term of the sequence. However, if we really want n to not start at 1, there is some handy notation to represent that. Let's continue to consider this sequence, a n equals 1 over n. Another way we could write this sequence is by using set brackets like we did earlier, but instead of listing terms of the sequence to describe the pattern, we just describe the pattern with the expression that defines it. So we would write curly brackets, and inside we put the expression for terms of the sequence, 1 over n. And then if we want n to start at something other than 1, we can write that at the bottom. We can say n starts at 3, for example. And if we want it to be an infinite sequence, we can write infinity at the top. And this describes the sequence 1 third, 1 fourth, 1 fifth, and so on. However, if we wanted the sequence to stop at n equals 5, we could write 5 at the top, and then our sequence would just consist of these three terms. In general, if we represent a sequence using some expression like this, and we don't specify that n is greater than or equal to some value that we want it to start at, it will be assumed that n starts at 1. Or we may also have to assume that n starts at the smallest positive integer for which the expression is defined. For example, for this expression, we might assume that n is greater than or equal to 3 so that the sequence consists of real numbers. So there's a bunch of fun notation for you. Now let's quickly touch on a little bit more vocab. Do you notice if the terms of this sequence are approaching any particular value? It looks like the terms are getting closer and closer to 1. For example, the 100th term of the sequence, which we looked at a few minutes ago, is equal to 100 over 101. That's approximately 1. Not quite, but almost. When the terms of a sequence get arbitrarily close to some value, like 1 in this case, we call that value the limit of the sequence. Furthermore, we say that the sequence converges to its limit, so we would say that this sequence converges to 1. We will, of course, talk about these terms and their definitions in detail in future lessons. A sequence that doesn't converge is said to diverge. For example, the nth term of this sequence is equal to n. This sequence diverges. Its terms get bigger and bigger. 
So in fact, we would say that this sequence not only diverges, but it diverges to positive infinity. Some sequences diverge to negative infinity, and some divergent sequences don't diverge to positive or negative infinity. We can, of course, get some idea of a sequence's behavior by plotting it on a graph. If we were to plot this sequence on a graph, for example, we'll plot it down here in the bottom right where we've still got some room, it would look something like this. And we could, of course, draw a line through the points of the sequence to get a smooth curve if we wanted to. When n equals 1, the sequence is equal to 1 half. And then it gets bigger and bigger, continuing to approach a value of 1, but never quite getting there. That's the limit. For the purpose of proofs, we may find it useful at times to represent a generic sequence. For example, we might do that by writing a sub n in brackets. Or if we needed to, we could put our sequence in set brackets, just say Sn for another example, and write the starting and ending points for n on the top and bottom like we did earlier. For example, maybe n starts at 5 and goes to positive infinity, or maybe it goes to positive 10. One other generic way we could describe a sequence, similar to the first way we wrote one down, is to list some generic terms like a1, a2, A3, and so on in set brackets. Similar to what we did earlier, we could also, after the ellipses, put a comma and then write a general term, AN, and then put some more ellipses. Having the AN in there is nice because it lets the reader know that we're going to represent a generic term from our sequence as AN. So there's a bunch of introductory material for you, some vocab and notation. For one last exercise, let's try rewriting this sequence, but in terms of a handy expression, like AN is equal to something, an expression for the nth term of this sequence. Let's take a close look at the terms of the sequence. The numerators start at 3 and then go up 1 each term. Meanwhile, in the denominators, we have increasing powers of 5. 5, 5 squared, 5 cubed, and so on. The only other detail we've got to deal with is that the signs of the terms are alternating. Positive, negative, positive, negative. So for our general expression, we might write n in the numerator and say that n has to be greater than or equal to 3. However, since we'd rather have n start at 1, we can just write n plus 2 in the numerator instead. Then when we plug in n equals 1, we'll get 3 in the numerator just like we want for the first term. For the denominator, we just have to divide by 5, and 5 is being raised to an increasing power. So, raise 5 to the power of n. Then in the first term, we'll have 5. In the second term, we'll have 5 squared, and so on. Lastly, how are we going to make the terms of this sequence alternate sign? Well, we'll have to multiply by a factor of negative 1 to some power. If we raise negative 1 to the power of n, that's close. The terms of the sequence will alternate sign. However, when we plug in n equals 1, our first term would be negative. We want our first term to be positive. So let's raise negative 1 to the power of n plus 1. This way, when we plug in n equals 1, we'll have negative 1 to the power of 2, which is positive, And so we'll just have a positive first term like we want. And there it is. That is our expression for the nth term of this sequence. So we could describe the sequence like this, or we could just use this instead, which frankly is more useful. Let's just take our expression for a spin and plug in n equals 3. The third term of the sequence, according to our expression, is negative 1 to the power of 3 plus 1 multiplied by 3 plus 2 divided by 5 to the power of 3. Negative 1 to the power of 3 plus 1 is negative 1 to the power of 4, which is just 1. Then 3 plus 2 is 5. 5 to the power of 3 is 125. And there we go. That is the third term of our sequence, and we see that it is correct. And I think that'll do it for today. So I hope this video helped you understand some language and notation that we use when talking about sequences. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, need anything clarified, or have any other video requests. If you find Wrath of Math helpful, I hope you'll consider supporting the channel with a small donation on PayPal or a small monthly pledge on Patreon. Links to those in the description. Be sure to subscribe for the swankiest math lessons on the internet. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you next time.